Huh. And now we will move to our last presentation. Thank you. Sorry. It will be by Indrikis Muzniaks, Molecular Microbiology in Latvia, going 3D. Thank you. And since we are already beyond the schedule and time is approaching for general discussion, it would be a bit rude for me to, to make all this long presentation, so I shortened a bit. And so I would like to give an abridged version. So, unless it works, yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is a type of uh, short overview, not about a specific uh, experiment, about specific task to be uh, approached, but uh, overview on uh, a research direction which we have uh, pursued for some years already and which can be seen in the context of molecular biology developments in Latvia. And when talking about molecular biology, I would understand uh, the approaches which are mostly not only addressing uh, the molecular basis of physiological processes, but those approaches which take uh, use of uh, molecular cloning methods and uh, taking approach uh, using uh, plasmid by technology as the basis of uh, development of this or other experimental uh, technique. So, uh, what is the outline? I mentioned already what I understand under the term of molecular microbiology. Then, uh, my main issue is Taking, bringing your attention to the fact that uh, we are by now mostly addressing molecular microbiology in two-dimensional approach, looking at sequences, looking, looking for uh, sequence elements, but not or somehow neglecting the fact that those sequences are uh, performing at the three-dimensional space. And uh, then uh, I would like to demonstrate with few examples, case studies, where this approach is being used in our laboratory to show how the molecular architecture influences the gene uh, activity, expression, and so on. And then, of course, conclusions. So, from your previous sessions, you've been already informed, and you are aware that uh, there are many centers where molecular approaches are made uh, use in Latvia, uh, for example, biomedical study center, where a lot of uh, bad technology, construction work of virus like particles, expression of catalogic proteins, and, and other things are going on, also in the Institute of Microbiology and Biotechnology, even in sense of systemic biology, because uh, many of those systemic biology things are being done using also plasmid or recombinant plasmid carrying strains. Also, uh, modeling of amino acid biosynthesis, which uh, is very such a long standing and uh, well developed uh, uh, direction of research at this institute. It should be mentioned as a, one of the molecular microbiology uh, developments in Latvia. And uh, another institute which carries the name of microbiology, which is in the uh, Stradinch University, mostly uh, concentrating on medical issues. They are using also molecular microbiology approaches in, uh, di for diagnostic purposes. So this is the landscape. And this landscape still is mostly working on two-dimensional uh, space as we have a list of paper in front of us where the sequences are written, those sequences we can analyze, those are all well described methods and approaches, and what we are forgetting that this sequence on the paper of uh, nucleotides or amino acids in the real cell, they are 
getting this three-dimensional structure. And in this three-dimensional structure, it is very important not just the linear connection between the elements, but uh, the spatial distribution of those elements on the whole molecular architecture. Because once you have some promoter, it's very important to know if it is located in some more or less neutral, neutrally uh, uh, located uh, molecular domain, or if it is exposed, or probably if it is somewhere hidden inside the molecule. And uh, this effect of localization, of course, in many cases can modify and influence the results you will get. And as far as we know, there are many, uh, many stories of success and many stories of um, not that big successes which are not published and where just one small uh, change in the structure whose influence cannot be really easily explained in terms of linear structure has brought up uh, in significant uh, changes in the results we have obtained at the end. So what is this structure which uh, can be uh, also modeled, which can be approached by different experimental methods, which is influencing and uh, delimiting uh, the special localization of genes and their regulatory elements. This is the plasmid supercoiling feature. Plasmids are plectonemically supercoiled. This DNA double helix is super twisted in higher order helix, which is characterized by linking number and by the super coiling density, which shows us how many super coiling twists we have per the molecular length for the, for the length of the molecule. Uh, this supercoiling can be changed during uh, the cultivation of uh, bacterial cells, and uh, this, they hear uh, the two enzyme systems in bacteria, topoisomerases and gyrases, play a very important role. And it can be changed also in vitro by adding intercalating agents to the plasmid molecules. And in this sense, this super cause can be called negative and positive. Then it can be turned from negative to positive, depending on how much those intercalating agents and how, so how, how many of them we add to the plasmid molecules. And the most popular use of those intercalators are ethidium bromide and also chloroquine, which are specific planar molecules tending to uh, insert themselves between the uh, nucleotide, nucleotide base pair planes in the DNA molecule. And the result, the molecule is, which is super twisted, gets untwisted slowly. And when it is untwisted completely, obtaining its relaxed form here, thereafter, it's starting to be retwisted again to, to this positive super cold form. And what we can obtain under specific conditions of electrophoresis, this is this nice pattern of um, uh, ladder form uh, bands where each band differs from the previous one by one additional right linking number. And uh, the supercoiling density can be characterized by the way how easily you can untwist your molecule, how much intercalator is needed to obtain this untwisting pattern. So, and density is changing during the cell cycle. It's changed by replication, transcription. All the life events in the bacterial cell influences the supercoiling density. And on the other hand, the supercoiling density can be viewed as a very, such an integral, holistic 
in, uh, 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 such reflection of the processes which take place in uh, the cell. And here you see, for example, uh, the gel showing how with the age, with the, uh, during the growth time in batch culture, the supercoiling density decreases because here you have added the same amount of uh, the intercalator and at the beginning the DNA is not changed that much. You can see only starting of uh, untwisting of the molecule and at the end the same amount of the intercalator has untwisted the supercoiled molecule to completely relaxed form uh, at the same concentration. And of course you need to have nice approaches, you need to have sensitive methods to see this supercoiling. In this respect we have developed some of them. For example, you see that, uh, for example, southern blotting is very uh, useful to, to obtain uh, such more decent, more uh, clear uh, pictures of how the supercoiling density works here. It's also two-dimensional approaches uh, of gels showing how those uh, specific topoisomer families can be uh, then uh, separated each from other are very important in this respect. Other point I want to bring up here is that supercoiling can be also influenced not only by the physiological conditions, by the cell uh, factors uh, which are changing during the cell life, but also they can be influenced from bottom-up approach, so from by the sequence, how the plasmid is made. So, and very important sequence elements which influence supercoiling are so-called intrinsically bent DNA segments, which are, uh, let's say, like uh, pins which inserted into the supercoiled molecular structure uh, mark and uh, fix down the points where the turns and where the, uh, let's say, exposed places of supercoiled molecule will be placed. Otherwise, this molecule will be, let's say, flexible. The strands will uh, slide each against other. But if you just put a hook into this strand, then this hook fixes some place where the turn over point will be placed. And so the molecular structure is uh, especially uh, is fixed to some extent in space. And this is shown some time already ago. And so how cloning of intrinsically bent DNA fragments can uh, uh, change the supercoiling uh, features of the molecule. And uh, when talking about intrinsically bent DNA, we have to remind ourselves that this is a specific uh, sequence dependent DNA bending structure. Here's an electromicroscopical view of one such a uh, para, uh, para, paradigm uh, element of intrinsically bent DNA, kinetoplast DNA fragment. And um, this uh, bends, those bends can be uh, formed either by uh, junctions of DNA stretches with uh, different uh, conformation types or by just uh, uh, changing, slightly changing uh, and uh, angles between uh, stacked um, DNA base pair stacks in the molecule, especially in the repetitive A and T track, uh, stretches, so that uh, those uh, accumulation of small changes in wedge roll and tilt angles between those uh, consecutive base pairs in the end effect give uh, an such a stable in, uh, bent DNA structure, which of course is uh, again uh, changed uh, and uh, changing during uh, at the, the uh, in response to the temperature or to other uh, environmental physical chemi physical chemical uh, influences. 
And this, again, can be easily measured and seen by uh, rather simple uh, physical chemical methods, like uh, here it is uh, by uh, electrophoresis in uh, polyacrylamide amide gels, where the same lengths fragment, it's our old work, uh, from adenoviral promoter is uh, the, the, all those fragments are of the same molec uh, molecular length, but their movement changes in the gel depending on the placement of this bent DNA fragment within this molecule. You can imagine if the bent is close to the middle point of the molecule, then its movement through the gel matrix, which is here shown in schematical way, like, like this pinpointed rod plate, then it will flow through this plate a bit slower than the stride fragment or the fragment where the, the band is close to the end. And how does it all influence our functioning of our recombinant strains where, which we are constructing by inserting uh, genes into vector plasmids and trying to obtain uh, the products of ex uh, their expression in DNA or proteins. We know that all those vector plasmids we use in contrast to the native plasmids from, uh, from which we can isolate from the uh, natural strains, they are not stably maintained in bacterial populations. If we don't apply selective pressure, those uh, plasmids are lost, some very quickly, some not that quickly, but uh, this plasmid loss can be characterized by uh, the number of uh, uh, cycles of growth in batch culture in non-selective media when more than 50% of the cells still maintain uh, the plasmid of our interest. And uh, if we are following up uh, the fate of such plasmids in uh, lengthy cultivation processes, we can obtain, uh, in vivo, obtain stab stabilized mutants where this stabilization is the result of in vivo transposition of different IS elements into vector plasmids. And this, those uh, mutants we obtain uh, then can be cultivated without any applying uh, any selective pressure for lengthy time like their natural counterparts. Uh, is this IS integration just a and the stabilization of the plasmid molecules uh, just a result of inactivation of some antibiotic resistance genes? Not. That we have not at all. We have shown that by recloning of those uh, specific uh, in, uh, insertion sequences which stabilize the plasmid structure into other places of the plasmid replicon, we don't obtain the same uh, stabilization effect as we have by in vivo insertions. Here we have more than 40 cycles of growth, and if we reclone in the same gene which has been inactivated by this first insertion, but in other bit, other place, only by 100 base pairs uh, different from the initial insertion place, then the stability is dramatically again decreased and gets back to this original uh, stab uh, stability of the plasmid, which is uh, PBR329, is one of those which is very unstable ones in the bacterial replica. And what do we see in all those places? We see that the, first of all, that the plasmid supercoiling density is dramatically different 
in those which those plasmids which are stable and those which are unstable at the beginning of the cultivation you don't see this difference at the end of the stationary phase but of course the early life determines all your further fate. It's also true for bacterial cultures, so what you have learned during your childhood you will remember forever. And bacterial plasmids, it is important to maintain low supercoiling density, which is associated with higher copy numbers at the very beginning of the cultivation. And to avoid and to see where the uh, intrinsically bent DNA comes in in this respect, since all those insertion sequences which, were, which we were talking about, which are stabilizing bacterial replication, all of them main, uh, contain in their structure strongly pronounced bent DNA sequences in the structure. We've done another experiment where those striped or bent DNA fragments have been cloned in the plasmid which does not contain or without outside the antibiotics resistance gene, but so that this DNA fragment is located in the plasmid structure opposite to the origin region, which is again responsible for plasmid replication regulation. And what we have obtained that a bent fragment dramatically, no, no, not dramatically, it just secures successful replication of the plasmid in this construction, while a uh, striped, not bent fragment gives very poor, very poorly replicating plasmids. And this again is linked to changes, respective changes in the plasmid supercoiling density. Those plasmids which are replicating better are less densely supercoiled than those at, at, which are poor at, uh, at this replication. So what is then the link between density and replication? Here we come to the process of uh, regulating gene expression through molecular architecture of the plasma. So what does it mean, again, getting back here, what is the ultimate factors regulating plasmid replication? Those are, in fact, two gene promoters, promoters P4 and P3, uh, which are responsible for RNA1 synthesis, RNA which is uh, initiator RNA, primer for plasmid DNA replication, and antisense P3, or product or RNA1, which is uh, impeding the process. So the interplay of those two RNA molecules is detrimental for plasmid number uh, uh, rep uh, determination, which in the end effect we see as the plasmid molecule accumulation. And in place, in case that we have uh, intrinsically bent DNA fragment cloned on the plasmid molecule opposite to one of those promoters, we see very clearly detectable changes in the relative ratios of those RNA1, RNA2, molecule concentrations. And in the cells where the plasmid replication is going on more or less un, uh, no, unimpeded, we see that the RNA1 concentration, which is 
inhibitor of plasmid replication is much lower than in the cells where, uh, where those plasmids are, uh, uh, where the replication is uh, inhibited. So the placement of those structural components of into the plasmid molecule influences the uh, expression of the genes which are located on very different distant place of the plasmid molecule. So the, here the gene regulation takes place through uh, long distance interactions or molecular architectural interactions of the plasma. And for more, let's say, uh, practically used approaches, the same effect we can see also uh, when we try to clone and to uh, see how, how the plasmid supercalling density influences, for example, the expression of uh, uh, human hepatitis B virus core antigen gene mRNA at the, uh, also uh, which is cloned on the bacterial plasmids. So the less uh, supercoiled is the plasmid, the better is the expression of the gene. Of course, you can ask, and we can ask, what is then the cause and what is then the effect if the train is moving because of the smoke is coming out of the chimney or the chimney is <laughs> giving smoke because the train is moving. This is the same um, moment here. But what we can see here that by, and we have shown it, but that by adding to the culture small amounts of the intercalating antibiotics which are, uh, or antibiotics which uh, slow down the activity of gyrase, which is responsible for uh, the supercoiling, for, for introducing supercoils into the plasmid structure, then we can obtain also induction of the expression. And so we believe that not the supercalling is going down because the transcription takes place, but, because, but uh, vice versa, transcription is taking place because supercalling is going down. And another aspect, other third, let's say, case study in our, uh, our experimentation is uh, the supercalling the super that influences intramolecular recombination. We know that uh, the plasmids which contain direct DNA repeats often undergo recombination and in the end effect uh, this one large plasmid then is split into two smaller ones and you see at the for electrophoresis picture, this is uh, the larger plasmid, and then it is uh, uh, just uh, giving out that a smaller molecule which contains the origin of replication, and the other part of the molecule is lost because there is no origin of replication. And again, in this case, the recombination within the plasmid molecule takes place in the molecules which are more relaxed than not in the molecules which have higher supercalling density, which is shown here by the differences, I will not go into details, but differences on the electrophoresis pictures of the plasmids in the presence or without ethidium bromide added into the gel. Here you see those plasmids which have undergone uh, the replication are now positively supercalled. Here they are negatively supercalled and uh, less supercalled than those which do not undergo this recombination. So, in conclusion, what we can say that intrinsically bent DNA is important mental in shaping the structure of supercoiled DNA molecules. 
and that reduced super coiling density of the plasma facilitates main processes where those plasmids are working. This is replication, plasmid gene expression, and recombination. So what we can say that the topology of DNA has to be considered in all the processes which we are trying to implement, which we are trying to use to achieve our practical applied goals, also probably also in systems biology. This is an ad additional aspect which has to be addressed if we want to see the system in whole working. But again, since the decrease of supercoiling density is in many cases activating all the plasmid processes, and this decrease is, uh, no, yeah, the results in the relaxation of the plasma molecule. For us, the main, say, uh, le uh, lesson from all those things is the importance of relaxation. So, our conference is coming to the end, and I guess it's time also to relax, not only for plasmids, but also for us ourselves. And I want to say, okay, thanks to our team who have participated in this research and for all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Do we have questions? Yes, please. Just general question. Uh, <coughs> general question. From the viewpoint of systems biology, the question is, uh, what are the energetic costs for this unwinding and supercoiling? Can you estimate? Uh, what does it mean for the cell from the viewpoint of so, ATP? Yes, uh, it can be estimated because there are four enzyme systems, in fact, uh, introducing and reducing supercoiling uh, density of DNA molecules. And any, every one of, every of those four systems have different ATP consumption approaches. Uh, most, two of them are working on the energy which is uh, accumulated in the mechanical way, let's say, like a spring. The DNA is winded and the energy is conserved within this, no, let's say, uh, spring-like structure of DNA. Once releasing the spring, the energy is getting out. On the other hand, the gyrase uh, system, which is uh, again composed of two different proteins, it is ATP consuming and this winding of the watch, let's say, takes an energy. So, but uh, it was one or two, I'm not sure, ATP per added super turn. Unwinding is... Yes, more questions, please. Please, Tonya. Well, thank you for a very interesting talk. I wondered if you could um, comment a little bit more on the um, sequence specificity for the bent DNA to be a, a target for the gyrase or topoisomerase. You main, mentioned uh, AT-rich repeats, mm -hmm. but yeah. is there, does uh, sequence specificity mean something? And most, the most important thing for those, I have not the sequence is shown here, but uh, for example, those two segments which we have used for cloning and uh, investigating their influence on the plasma replication, those are 42 nucleotide long DNA fragments, synthetic oligonucleotides, uh, where the only difference is uh, the distribution of A and T nucleotides against each other. So, uh, and it can be also, we have those programs developed by ourselves, and there are other programs also available on the internet, which gives you a guess 
of the molecular of any uh, sequence about uh, in terms of its uh, curvature linear curvature and this again can be tested verified experimentally and we have done this work with tens of different molecules and if you want to know uh, let's say such a preliminary information about your particular sequence either we can try our program or we can give you our program to test by yourself how curved the sequence will be but again this program gives you the curvature of linear sequence this linear sequence performs differentially there should be also the flexibility between uh, the base pairs taken into account this works different if you place it into the supercoiled replica so it is for, for example those AT tracts they are quite easily identifiable and they perform quite reliably also if you clone them and there are a number of other nucleotide steps which also can introduce supercoiling but which are has to be addressed in every case particularly because of the flexibility of sequences we have one more question please thank you um, I wanted to ask when you introduce the supercoils uh, how stable is this effect because um, maybe I have the impression that uh, this will be removed by this replication machinery during uh, the first round like by topoisomerases or not, or just uh, the supercoils of course we can see on the let's say DNA molecules which have finished their replication where the, also the primer RNA has been already taken away where all the gaps have been filled in and then the supercoil which has been obtained at this particular stage remains quite stable during different chemical procedures you can isolate the different methods cesium chloride centrifugation uh, uh, alkaline denaturation whatever you like uh, phenol extraction the supercoiling density of the molecules which you obtain from the cell at the given moment you have stopped its growth it's not changing so the supercoiling itself is pretty stable it changes only within the cell because of those processes which I have mentioned before uh, you, you under the same physiological conditions <laughs> conditions it will be the same but you no, in, in terms no uh, I cannot influence I cannot change by chemical methods of isolation uh, the cell is okay I can change of course uh, again in vitro by adding topoisomerase I can add uh, the um, intercalating substances and I can uh, obtain reliably rep uh, repetitive results but uh, no, yeah, it's not the supercalling itself is quite a stable property of the thank you very much I thank all the speakers for this session, final session. Dear colleagues, we came to the end of our scientific program. Thinking about uh, our Congress, I suppose it seems to me, as an organizer, that our idea was realized, and the first Congress of 
Baltic microbiologist, was rather successful. At least it seems to me that the main goal to just to get idea on the wax which are realized in microbiological institutions of different countries of Baltic Sea region uh, that we have succeeded with this idea. It seems to me that there was uh, arranged some networks during these some days and uh, I hope that there will be also active cooperation between new friends, new colleagues, new teams. Uh, taking some general words, I want to tell that we had, in total, we had 120 participants from eight countries. Uh, and it is not too small amount if to take into account, for example, first Congress of FEMS, which was about 10 years ago in Slovenia, in Ljubljana, which have uh, taken about 500 uh, scientists from the whole Europe, so 120 from eight countries is not too small, it seems to me. Uh, we had 22 lectures, 23 oral presentations and a lot of posters. So the program was rather full, I would say. Uh, we worked intensively three days from the early morning almost to the late evening, including today, this day, when we will start the last session in the Hotel Riga again at 7 o'clock. And we agreed that we have to meet somewhere in the lobby 15 to 7. I hope a lot that all of you enjoyed this meeting. I hope a lot that this initiative of Lat Latvian Society for Microbiology will be supported by other societies and that this Congress will be first but not the last. I hope that other societies will pro propose the idea of the arranging the second Congress in some other country in two years because next year it cannot be uh, arranged because of FEMS Congress. But in the case no wishes we will receive from other societies, we are ready to arrange also the second Congress in Riga in two years. And at the end, I would like to thank all of you who came to Riga and who participated, who actively worked during these three days. I would like to thank also FEMS, Federation of European Microbiological Society, for great support of this initiative. I would like to, to thank our special guests, President of FEMS, Professor Bernhard Schink, and General Secretary General of European Microbiology Forum, Professor Tone Tonium, for coming and giving lectures, not only about FEMS and uh, uh, European, Federation, uh, European Microbiology Forum, but also scientific lectures. I would like to ask uh, to thank all members of our international organizing committee, all members of our local organizing committee, and especially those people which worked a lot to make this idea realistic. So I would like to thank especially Professor Uldic Kalnex and my colleague Yanis Lepinch for structurization of the program. I want to thank a lot my colleagues, Yanis Lepinch, Agnese Kokina, and Diana Borovikov for their big load that they have made realistic our meeting here. And it seems that we had no big problems during these three days. Thank you once more for your coming, for your participation, for your activity. And maybe somebody from you want to tell something else? Um, thank you for uh, um, nice words. Um, two housekeeping issues. Uh, one thing 
I think uh, our guides are waiting for you downstairs. Another thing, uh, there are still a lot of snacks and coffee downstairs, so make a choice. <laughs> Thank you. And just a moment, uh, Sasha. Uh, Thank you again for this beautiful event you have organized. I guess it's very important in one additional aspect. Of course, it's very nice to get together and to learn a bit more about our uh, common achievements and problems, but it will be of special importance and seeing the representative of Brooker here within our uh, audience. I would like to drive your attention that those machines are nice. Those machines are magnificent and uh, do a lot of job, but they are expensive. And if we want to obtain them, we have to cooperate. And for the next period of the European financial planning, which starts with 2014, the European Commission wants us to present not just the wish list of our purchases, but a strategy of joint activities towards uh, goals which can be achieved not only in one country separately, but by joining our uh, efforts towards promoting innovation, towards promoting entrepreneurship, all those good things which in fact we are trying to do, but which can be achieved better through synergies, through cooperation, and our region of cooperation is the Baltic region. And it's nice that uh, not only our neighboring countries, Lithuania and Estonia, are participating, but also colleagues from Sweden, from Germany, from other countries, where we will be forced, will we need to develop smart specialization strategies, synergies, so on and so on. And in this respect, I would like to say that for this purpose in Latvia, we have uh, just established a non-governmental organization, which is called Baltic Infrastructure for uh, Research, Technology and Innovation. And I would also use this moment to, to advocate for uh, similar activities also in other countries and of course our professional associations like uh, Society for Microbiology is the one which can be very influential in our countries to, to, to start those mutual activities for uh, we yeah, are getting uh, along with those tasks we have to accomplish during the next year because those strategies and, and, and plans will be needed once we want to have the nice broker instrument in our lab. Otherwise, it won't work. So, thank you. <laughs> Let's so, thank you once more.